My name is Chris Nichols. I uh, am the founder and principal scientist for Chris Systems uh, Education and Consulting. And Chris is an acronym. It uh, stands for Knowledge for Regeneration and Innovation in Soils. And basically what um, my presentation was about, as well as uh, what uh, Chris Systems is about, is looking at how we can utilize uh, soil biology to help to improve soil health and utilize the biogeochemical system in order to be able to build resilient agroecosystems by looking at ecofunctional intensification. And that is going to be able to help to produce these systems that are going to be more resilient. They're going to be able to help resist uh, pests and diseases and also be able to be more uh, economically viable. Thank you. Um, it's uh, great to be back in Bismarck Mandan. Um, and I'm just going to load this up really quick. So when I got here, um, I've been gone from Bismarck Mandan. I was here for about 11 years. Um, when I got back here to Bismarck Mandan, I, um, I had my presentation kind of together, and I, I knew a little bit of what I was going to talk about. And I figured, you know, I knew where I was going to go. And then I got a little bit sentimental, and I thought, you know, I'll do a little bit of a retrospective a little bit and think a little bit about where I've been and, and, and what it was, because as I go around and have the opportunity to be able to talk with farmers um, around the country and around the world, um, I really talk about the fact that although I've gotten advanced degrees, I got some of the best education that I've ever had in my life here in North Dakota. Uh, and so as I look around this room, uh, I figure that there's probably at least 100, if not 200, of my teachers that are here. And so I want to sort of recognize some of the teachers that I have that are in this room. Um, I worked at the Northern Great Plains Research Laboratory uh, just across the river in Mandan. And so I know that there are some of you that are in this room. If you want to put up your hands, those of you who worked or have worked or are working at the Northern Great Plains Research Laboratory that are here, um, they're representing the, the ARS facility. Uh, I know that you're here in this room. Um, and so I want to thank you for the education that you brought to me, as well as the farmers that helped to support that through the Area 4 research farm. So I want to recognize all of you because you also helped to educate me. Um, and I know that some of you are here as well in this room. So if you want to put up your hands, you brought me a lot of education. I learned a lot in being able to work with these farmers that are here and being able to work with these researchers. Again, this was the best education that I had in my life. I also learned a lot from being able to work with the Minokan farm. Um, and so those of you that are here that are working at the Minokan farm or helped to set up the Minokan farm, um, I want to recognize you as well. So again, everybody that has been a part of my education, I want you to really, you know, recognize what it is that you were able to bring to my life and to this soil regeneration and the soil regenerative movement. I don't want to, you know, toot my own horn or anything like that, but I think, again, as the speakers before me have talked about, this is really about a community and it's really about peer-to-peer -peer education and being able to grow on what it is that you learn from others. The biggest thing, the best thing that you can have, and I read, am talking to um, not just uh, the farmers and others in this room, but to the students that are in this room, the best thing that you can do is to ask why. Always challenge your professors and teachers. When I get done giving a speech, oftentimes I will say, do you have any questions, comments, or criticisms? I love criticisms. Critique me. Tell me where I'm wrong. Challenge me. The best education that I got was being able to go out on farmers' fields and for them to ask me questions. 
And when I didn't know the answer, I don't know how many times I went out to Gabe Brown's fields or to Glenn Bauer's fields or to Marlon Richter's fields or to how many different fields that I went to, and I would go out to their farms and I would look at that and I would go to Gene Govins and I would go to Ken Miller's. I would go to these fields and I would come back and I would say to myself, after they would ask me questions and I would go back into my office and I would pull text box off the shelf and I would go on the internet and I would try and figure out what is going on because I didn't understand it completely. I'm a soil microbiologist and this is an incredibly intricate and dynamic system that it is that we're looking at. It's incredibly diverse and it plays by these rules that we have no understanding of. And I don't know if we're ever going to have a complete understanding of what the rules are, but what it is that we're looking at is figuring out how we can work with these systems. And so I started this company called Chris, and I didn't start Chris to be egotistical. So, you know, my name is Chris, and I call a company Chris, and I had a friend who was like, oh, yeah, the best thing that you could ever do is I, I can't believe it. You got a company named after yourself. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I just actually have an intelligent spouse who figured out how to get, create an acronym out of my name. Um, but the whole idea behind it is what's important about that is the second word, which is systems. And what those letters represent is the knowledge for regeneration and innovation. Having innovated systems and how that's going to be able to regenerate things. And so the education that I got here in North Dakota was helping me to have that knowledge for innovation and regeneration. And so I look at my past and where I came from. This individual here is the most stubborn man that I know. He is my father. I love him dearly. He purchased the farm that I was, the year that I was born. This is our farm in southwestern Minnesota. And I would talk to him for a number of years about many things in soils and soil microbiology and, edu and agriculture. And one of the things that he taught me throughout the years as I was growing up about agriculture and appreciating the land was to run away from it and get away as far as, and fast as possible. Because God knows when I grew up, I didn't want to go back to the farm. I didn't want to be a farmer. I didn't want to work on the farm. I hadn't wanted nothing whatsoever to do with farming. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. I wanted to get as far away as, and fast as possible. And I went to school. I wanted to go away from it. And I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Because that was not what I was interested in doing. And he also taught me, though, that part of what you do and part of what's in you is the soil. Growing up on a farm, you learn about how much you care about the land and how much of that is part of you. And so as far and as fast as I ran, I couldn't get away from what was in my roots. I couldn't get away from that soil. It followed me wherever I went. I went to West Virginia, and I went to Maryland, and I went a long ways away. I moved 2,000 miles away <laughs> to try and get away from this. <laughs> and I couldn't get away from it because it was a part of me. But he also, as I was talking with him, and we would talk about many things when I would come back, and the things that I learned about soils and soil microbiology, he was one who wasn't really necessarily accepting of everything that I was talking to him about because his past and his education was all involved in what we had as the current paradigm of conventional agriculture. That everything was focused on yields. If there is one word that I would like to eliminate from agriculture as a whole, from our English language, is the word yield. Because we don't use it appropriately. This is not a good word. 
And so when I would talk with him about things and about innovations that he could put into place, it was always, well, you know, that's just not going to work, and I need to do this because I have to get these yields, and we have to put these inputs in, and we have to do these types of things, and I have to grow these types of crops and all of these different types of things. And I would talk to him about cover crops, and I came to North Dakota, and I talked to him about all of the farmers that I met. And so one year he came up to visit me, and I planned it strategically around a Burley County Field Day. <laughs> so we went to, I took him to the Burley County Field Day. And he talked with the farmers at the Burley County Field Day, and guess what? On the way back to my house in Mandan, he's calling and ordering cover crop seed. Because he's not going to listen to me, but he's going to listen to these other farmers that he's going to talk to. And I know that, and that's OK. Because he recognized, I recognize the fact that you're probably not going to listen to me. And that's OK. But one of the big things that has happened to me since I left North Dakota and as I was leaving North Dakota was the fact that I came to the realization and I started Chris Systems because of the fact that I've come to the realization that we have no more time. And I'm talking to all of you, but especially to the students that are in the room. We are running out of time. And I don't mean to be really negative about things, but here is the reality. And you don't have to listen to me, and I'm going to say a lot of really bad words, and I apologize to the committee that invited me, but you created me. <laughs> so you're stuck. I'm sorry you were the educators. You created me. The monster that's in the room is your own creation. <laughs> I'm going to say some bad words that you're not going to like. I'm going to say an O word called organic probably more than once. I'm going to possibly say a C word called climate change that you may not like. I'm going to say words like consumers and consumer demand that you may not like. And I'm going to say words like health that you may not like. But the reality is, is we have no more time. You have no more money, right? We don't have time and we don't have money to fool around with this stuff anymore. I'm sorry, but that's where we're at. We don't have time and we don't have money. This is the reality of where we live now. This is what it is that we're faced with. I was in Iowa recently and I told the farmers in Iowa, and I'm luckily that I'm still alive, but I was in Iowa recently and I told the farmers in Iowa that they're growing an industrial product in low grade feed and they got to quit it. They live on some of the best land on the planet, and they grow low-grade feed and an industrial product. And I have no idea why they do that. And you guys want to do the same thing all over the US and the Canadian provinces. You're determined to grow low-grade feed in an industrial product for pennies on the dollar. You're determined to pay people for products that are 50% or less efficient. This is what you pay for when you pay for fertilizers, for synthetic fertilizers. We've always known that they're 50% or less efficient. Why do you do that? I've asked that question for 25 years to my father and to everybody else, and I don't understand it. No one can explain this to me, except for they tell me that it's the Y word, because it's all about yield. What we're facing now is a consumer that is primarily the growing consumer that is a millennial. And yes, that's another M word that you may not like, a millennial. I know, lots of words you don't like. Millennials are demanding higher quality food. And they're not just demanding higher quality food because they like to be foo-foo. They like to be hoity-toity. 
You can make those excuses if you want, but they're demanding higher quality food because we also are living in an environment in which we have health care that we can't afford. More than a quarter of the income for the average family goes to pay out of care, out of pocket health care costs in the United States right now. This is not something that we can continue to afford to do. We live on some of the best land in the US and in Canada, and I know there are Canadians that are here, so this goes to Canada too, not necessarily the cost of healthcare, but we live on some of the best land in the United States and Canada, and in both the US and Canada, we are suffering from obesity and malnutrition at the same time in the same people. And we are doing this because we forgot that our food comes from soil. Because we are determined to grow low-grade feed in an industrial product for pennies on the dollar. And to pay somebody for products that are 50% or less efficient at 100% of the cost. Again, I don't have time for this anymore, and I don't have the money for this anymore, and I don't know why you do. You guys created the monster. <laughs> so this is where we're at. This is my past, and this is the, where I'm at now, but this is also the future of where it is that we're going. And what we get bogged down in is we get bogged down in language and dogma and terminology and divisiveness. O words are bad and M words are bad. All of these things are bad. So we can't talk about them. We get lost in the fact that dogma says, I was taught as a soil scientist that it takes a thousand years to grow an inch of topsoil. That you can't change organic matter percentages in your lifetime. Observation, putting my hands in the soil, has told me that that's not true. However, it also is true. Because things are true depending on one, your point of view, and two, what it is that we do. If you don't do things correctly, it's, you're not going to grow and change organic matter in your lifetime. That's true. But you can change organic matter percentages in your lifetime if you do things appropriately. It takes a thousand years to grow an inch of topsoil. If you're talking about creating topsoil by eroding the rock that's the parent material and having that migrate up to the surface and combine with organic matter. But we're talking about regenerating the soil, regenerating topsoil that Jeremy was talking about that we've already lost, regenerating that by harvesting sunlight from the top down instead of growing it from the bottom up. If we grow it from the bottom up, it takes a thousand years. If we do it from the top down, it doesn't take a thousand years. One thing doesn't necessarily make the other thing wrong or bad or inconclusive. It's a recent paper that came out that said that there's more microbial diversity in a no-till corn crop production system than in a prairie system. And several papers that, brought, that, that reinforced that. And that may very well be true. I'm not going to dispute that. One, because there's more, potentially more bacterial diversity. There are millions of different types of bacteria. If you have a community in which there are millions of you, there's a annual systems, annual corn crop systems especially, are going to be more bacterially dominated. If you have a community, a pool that are millions, in that pool, you can have a diverse community of millions that could be more diverse than in a community in which you would have a lot more fungi where you could have hundreds of thousands of you. 
So your diversity index could be higher where there's a pool of millions as opposed to a pool that's hundreds of thousands. Logic dictates that that could be true. It doesn't mean that the functionality and the quality of that system is better. We get ourselves focused on language and we say that one is better than the other. We get bogged down in these ideas. We tell ourselves that our only metric to how good our system is, is soil tests that give us ideas on what our fertility is. Why? What does that tell me when I take a soil probe and I take a sample from here, what is that on this day, what does that tell me about what's going to happen with my crop when I plant it and it needs nutrition to produce a grain five months from now? Over there. That makes no sense. But that's what we do, and that's what we count on, and that's what we tell ourselves. We have power in knowledge, and we have the power to utilize that. But more often, what we do is we focus on what it is we can take out of things instead of what it is that we can put into things. What I want you to start thinking about in our systems is how can we optimize our systems for better eco-functional intensification? Look at your farm, your whole entire farmscape. Every square foot of your farm, what is its optimum eco-function? And yes, it's an E-word. Environment and ecology are not bad things. Nobody's going to come in and regulate you for them if you don't let them. You have the power to change these things. You have the power to control what it is that you're giving the system. We can intensify our production. I'm not talking about, when I say I want the Y word to go away, I'm not talking about the fact that you're going to have less. What Lauren was talking about was not that you're going to yield overall less, because the productivity of your system is going to be higher. We're going to intensify the system. Part of the reason, too, that a prairie system may not be functioning at as high of a level as an agroecosystem is the level of intensity. Biology works in a way that responds to energy, to food. The idea is, is that we are all, all of us, every organism, is genetically programmed to be lazy. It's called conservation of resources. We are genetically programmed to do things in the most efficient manner possible. Now granted, as human beings, we screw this up all the time. I don't know how many times I got to go up and down the stairs, how many things I forget when I'm doing laundry that I got to go up and get come back down, all of those things. How many dishes you got to go back into the living room because you forgot that spoon, all of those things. But we're supposed to be efficient. That's how we're programmed. A native system functions at the lowest level. It responds to stressors at maximum efficiency. When a stress event comes along, when there's a fire, when there's grazing by wildlife, when the bison came through, any of those major stressors, maximum efficiency, and then it went back down. Maximum efficiency, and then it went back down. What we want to do in our agroecosystems 
with ecological intensification, eco-functional intensification, is we want to look what is the best function for that particular landscape. And then what we want to do is we want to help to input energy and input stressors into that system so that system is always fired, always going to be functioning, always going to be moving, always going to have that maximum amount of function. Keep it moving. Keep it going. Keep the stress up. Because that's how you get to have a healthy system. That's how it is that we're going to keep that system performing. That's how it is that we're going to put power into the system. When we look at soil health, we talk a lot about soil health. And I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And I highlighted function because I think function is one of the keys that we need to look at. And when we look at measuring soil health, functionality is one of the big things that we need to look at. What we do with measuring soil health these days when we're looking at indicators is we measure things like, again, fertility. But we don't necessarily measure function, functionality to the system. So when Jeremy was talking a lot about soil aggregation and infiltration and water holding capacity and those types of things, those are the things that are looking at function. How is the biogeochemical system all working together to create function? But the other thing I've been thinking about with the soil health is this idea that looking at soil health, when you look at this definition, this definition is all about taking. Again, when we think about language, when we think about the way that we treat things, this definition is all about what we can get from the soil. It's going to be a living system for us. What can we take from the soil? How can we impose our paradigm on the soil so that we can get the most out of it? That's not how you approach a system. That's not how you work with a system. That's not how you get the system to function. That's how you impose a design and control. We are in a chess game with nature. We always have been. That is what we are doing. And we are not going to win the chess game. Trust me, we're never going to win. That's not the point. The point is, is we have to quit losing pieces, and we have to, be, we have to quit being put into check. Because under our current paradigm of agriculture, that's what it is that we've done. We've just been losing pieces and been put into check. We need to wipe the board clean, put all our pieces back on there, and take a different approach that's focusing on a biogeochemical system that's going to help us build resilience and resistance and not be focused on winning and what we can take, but more on what we can gain by working with the system, not on moving things away, but what we can take. Because what we have done and what we haven't changed over the years is these degraded hotspots. The redder the color, the more degraded the soil is. Again, these are the best, some of the best soils on the planet. Look at how degraded they are. The redder they are, the more degraded they are. These are some of the best. Again, we don't have time or money. We're in serious trouble. This is not good, folks. These aren't degraded because they're frozen most of the time. But this is trouble. And part of the issue is, is that the soils have been hemorrhaging. We need to think about this differently. The soils have literally been hemorrhaging 
carbon. They've been hemorrhaging energy. They've been hemorrhaging the most valuable thing, just like as if a patient was bleeding to death. They've been hemorrhaging their most valuable resource. But what we do, how we look at trying to fix this, is we focus solely on individual things. When we focus solely on yield or no-till or grazing or something individual, even though we might think it's the right thing, that's just putting a Band-Aid on there. That's just stopping the bleeding. But we don't focus enough on the system to recognize that the soil is still dying. The soil is still degrading. The patient is going to die anyway without a systems approach. So we need to change the way we look at the system. And so the carbon is a key to this. The soils are deficient in carbon. Many of you have probably seen this. This is David Brandt's soil in Carroll, Ohio. This is the soil across the road. This is his soil. This is his NRCS classified soil, David Brandt's. This is what he has made his soil into. Because he has put carbon in his soil. This is what we can do. Agriculture needs to focus on solar energy. Lauren talked about the fact that there are, what, 140 growing degree days where you're at? I was down in Iowa. I told them that they need 280. In fact, I think they can push 320. I know that they do. I know that they can. Because this is not about growing degree days. This is about photosynthesis. When we told ourselves things were about growing degree days, we told ourselves everything was about these narrow windows of temperature. And it was focused in places like Iowa on growing a perennial tropical grass that we annualized into something we call corn. And we grow it in Iowa, and now we're trying to grow it in North Dakota, and we're trying to grow it in Canada. I was in the UK a few years back, and people were asking me when they were going to be able to grow corn in the UK, and I said, what, are you high? <laughs> it's a perennial tropical grass. <laughs> I don't get you. Seriously. Because what we want to do is we want to capture sunlight. Our soils are bleeding to death because they don't have carbon. And you want to put a perennial tropical grass on there? This is not the solution. The solution is being able to work with photosynthesis, to treat the soil like we're supposed to treat ourselves to be healthy. If you go to a doctor, the doctor will tell you you're not healthy. Pretty much everybody in this room, I apologize, but it is true, you will go to the doctor and the doctor will tell you you're not healthy. Because you, most of you are from the US or Canada. The doctor will tell you, even a few of you who are not from the US or Canada, if you're from a first world country, the doctor will tell you you're not healthy. And the doctor will tell you that to be healthy, these are the things you need to do. You need to eat small meals throughout the day, be a grazer. This is what we need to do to our soils. We need to feed them all the time. Give them energy. There is no reason why Lauren in Iowa, which is what he's doing, but all of his neighbors need to do it too, can't be growing something 320 days at least out of the year. There's absolutely no reason why that can't happen should happen here. I've been out sampling. And there's green stuff growing in November and December in Bismarck Mandan. I know that this can happen. 
You know that this can happen. So why do you tell yourself that it can't happen? You go out onto a prairie and you see it happening, but then you go into your field and say it can happen. What's the difference? The sunshine here, but not there? I love these little invisible barriers that happen. Rain falls there and not there. It's incredible how these things occur. Eat a diverse diet. It's the next thing the doctor will tell you. You've got to have more diversity. So we're going to grow a perennial tropical grass in a monoculture. Let's have more corn on corn, because that's profitable. We'll mix it up every once in a while. We'll add soybeans to it. Yeah. All right. Way to go. <laughs> this is going to get us to be healthy. All life follows. We don't have to understand it all. All life follows some very simple rules. We don't have to understand everything that goes on, but they all follow some very simple rules. You need energy. You want your food source to be kind of diverse because you need a lot of different molecules. You need a lot of different atoms to build all of the molecules that you need to produce all of the enzymes that you need to be able to break down all of the compounds and do all of your work. You want to have a little bit of exercise. We want our soils, our agroecosystems, to function like gold medal winning Olympic athletes. Right? You want to win. I know my dad does. He wants to be a winner. I know you do. How do you be a winner? Or do you want to be on the B team? It's OK to be on the B team. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize people on the B team. But you'd rather be a gold medal winning Olympic athlete. So you have to have stressors in the system. Guess what? A little bit of competition is OK. Plants actually need some stressors. They need some insects to actually bite on their leaves. Do you know what that does? Biting on the leaves actually stimulates the, the plants to make defensive compounds. Those defensive compounds are often antioxidants. You know what antioxidants are? They're good stuff for us to eat. Healthy food that consumers demand. If you want to meet that demand, you start growing the stuff and give your plant the stressors that this plant needs. If you want to grow the stuff that consumers demand. And then you've got to protect the soil. You've got to protect yourself from injury. Making sure that you have that armor on there. Something protecting that surface. Making sure that you have something that's covered. These are the things that you want to do. This is part of this revolution and the principles that we can have. So I'm going to skip over some things fairly quickly here. What we're seeing is we're seeing that we can stabilize organic matter by biological processes. So we're going to grow more organic matter from a labile pool and increase the amount of organic matter that we have in our soils by the biology that's there. And when you have the biology in our soils, you have an interactive carbon economy. Carbon is the energy and food source for almost all life on planet Earth, whether you're microscopic or macroscopic. And I say almost all life because there are organisms called diatoms. They're silica-based organisms. But pretty much everything else is carbon-based. Plants take CO2 from the atmosphere and energy from the sun, and they take that energy and they capture it in the bonds that they create by transforming CO2 into sugars. And that energy and that carbon, the carbon becomes the structural building blocks, and the energy from the sun provides the energy for everything to do all of its work. And the carbon provides the building blocks for everything. 
in the soil, you want to have in a healthy soil the equivalent on a microbial basis of somewhere between 17 to 25 cows every acre, and you need to be feeding them that equivalent of animals per acre every day. That's how much photosynthetic activity you need to have going on in a healthy soil. You talk to any livestock producer and they're going to tell you, could I have 17 to 25 animals on each acre, feed them every day, all day long, all year long, and they'll tell you you're high. That's what it is that we want to do in order to be able to get the system to work. So one of the ways in which we're doing this, I apologize, because see, I deviated. But I deviated for a point. One of the ways in which we're doing this is we're utilizing, again, these systems that work together. And Jeremy talked about this with the mycorrhizal fungi. So what we have here, I've got two points that I want to make, and I know I'm holding you guys up from lunch, but these will be really quick points. One of them is this. We have here, when it comes to synthetic fertilizer, this top graph shows our increase in yield over time since 1960. This bottom graph is what's called a nitrogen use efficiency curve. What that curve shows is that since 1960, it takes more nitrogen today to produce a bushel of grain than it took in 1960. I'll repeat that. It takes more nitrogen today to produce a bushel of grain than it took in 1960. Not just that we use more nitrogen today because our yield has gone up, but it takes more nitrogen today per bushel than it took in 1960. And the reason is, is not so much that our fertilizer use efficiency has, has gone down dramatically, because our fertilizer use efficiency when it came to synthetic fertilizer has always sucked. It's never been much more than 50% for nitrogen. It's never been much more than 30% for phosphorus. But what has happened is as the microbial communities have declined in our soils over time, what we got from our soils has been lost. And so what was made up from our soils could no longer be obtained, so more of it had to come from our synthetic fertilizers. We need to regenerate our soils. We're trying to do better with some of this because we're trying to time our fertilizer application better with how the plants are growing. But that's not going to be enough. We need to regenerate our soils in the microbial communities because one of the beautiful things that our microorganisms do is our microorganisms will do plant-to-plant -plant nutrient transfer. And this is one of my favorite ones. So we're going to have five organisms. We're going to have two plants. We're going to have a legume plant and a non-legume plant. We're going to have two bacteria. We're going to have a nitrogen-fixing bacteria and a phosphorus-solubilizing bacteria. And we're going to have one fungus, the mycorrhizal fungus. Now, the mycorrhizal fungus can connect the roots of the non-legume plant and the legume plant together. In the legume plant, you have these nodules where the rhizobium nitrogen-fixing bacteria live. They're going to take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into the nitrogen that the plant can utilize. Now, it takes a lot of energy to do this, just like it does for us. It's a very energy-intensive process. The Haber-Bosch process takes a lot of energy. For the cells to do this, for the bacteria to do this, it takes a lot of energy. It basically, on, on a cellular level, Energy goes through a cycle called the Krebs cycle. What that is, is you have a compound called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. There's three phosphate groups attached to a sugar. All right, what happens is one of those phosphate groups gets ripped off, 
And when that phosphate group gets ripped off, electrons are released. Electrons go through a membrane, pass through a membrane, and they release energy. So that fires the cell. Basically, it takes 32 cycles, so 32 of the process of getting ripped off, to fix one molecule of N2 gas. To fix one molecule of nitrogen into the nitrogen that the plant needs, it takes 32 of these to have this process happen, all right? It's very energy intensive. You can't take the phosphorus that got ripped off and put it back on. In this cycle, the ATP goes into ADP because one of the phosphates gets ripped off. It becomes adenosine diphosphate. Phosphate group comes back in. New phosphate group comes back in. It becomes ATP, okay? So we got that going on inside the nodule with the rhizobium bacteria. Now, you have the mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi go out into the soil, and they connect the roots together. The roots can grow next to each other, but they can't anneal. They can't grow into each other. The mycorrhizal fungi will penetrate the cell walls and go right up to the cell membranes. This is a very efficient nutrient transfer. They can pick stuff up right at the membrane. They knock on the door, take the nutrients, go into the other organism, knock on the door, take the nutrients. You can move them around, all right? So we've got the shuttle process happening. Now, as they're growing through the soil, as they're growing from one plant to the other plant, they have on their hyphae in the soil another bacteria that lives on the hyphae. These are phosphate solubilizing bacteria. What these bacteria do is they produce an enzyme that's able to break down phosphorus that's usually not available in the soil. So that phosphate solubilizing bacteria can now take unavailable phosphate and make it available. So what happens is you have the mycorrhizal fungus. It's in the non-legume plant. That non-legume plant says to the mycorrhizal fungus, all right, today I need nitrogen and phosphorus. Mycorrhizal fungus says, all right, I can handle that. I have these phosphate cellulizing bacteria that live in the soil that are going to give me phosphorus. And I'm with this legume plant that's going to be able to give me nitrogen because it's got excess nitrogen. So you give me some carbon and I'll be able to do that. I have to give some of that carbon to the phosphate cellulizing bacteria in order for them to be able to produce the enzyme to solubilize the phosphate. And then I'll be able to get this for you. So the non-legume plant says, all right, cool deal. So the mycorrhizal fungus then goes over to the legume plant, and it says, all right, you've got to give me some nitrogen in order to be able to do this. And the legume plant says, okay, I got that covered. I'm just going to go to my rhizobium bacteria and get some more nitrogen. So it goes to the rhizobium bacteria, and the rhizobium bacteria says, okay, I can do that, but here's the deal. In order for me to be able to do that, I need to have some more phosphate, because if I'm producing enough nitrogen for you and enough nitrogen for this non-legume plant, you're going to have to give me more phosphate in order to be able to do that. So the, non -le or the legume plant then says to the mycorrhizal fungus, you've got to give me more phosphate. So the mycorrhizal fungus says, all right, that's okay, I can do that. You give me more sugar, I'll be able to do that because I can make this deal with the phosphate solubilizing bacteria. So the mycorrhizal fungus goes to the phosphate solubilizing bacteria and it says, all right, you've got to kick up the phosphate solubilization. The phosphate solubilizing bacteria says, okay, we can do that. So it's solubilizing a whole bunch of phosphate here out into the soil and the nitrogen is being transferred to the non-legume plant and everybody's happy. But all of a sudden, there's a traffic jam because there's too much phosphate that has to be absorbed. And so the traffic jam is happening here. So the mycorrhizal fungus is kind of stuck. And it goes over here to the non-legume plant because they've had a really old relationship. They've been around for several millennia. And they basically say they're sitting around in coffee one day and then mycorrhizal fungus says to the non-legume plant, it says, well, I could have covered all your needs, but the problem is, is that I have a traffic jam when it comes to this phosphate. And I can't get enough phosphate to the legume plant in order for the legume to give enough phosphate to the rhizobium bacteria for the rhizobium bacteria to fix enough nitrogen in order for that nitrogen to be able to get into uh, me to be able to give that to, the, uh, to you. And the non-legume plant says, okay, you know what, I can get that covered because all I have to do is I just am basically going to sit here and, and what I will do is I will, I will basically be able to absorb that. I will give you the secret code so that you can absorb more phosphate against a gradient. So the mycorrhizal fungus says, okay, cool deal. So it goes back to the phosphate solubilizing bacteria. It takes the secret code. It's able to absorb phosphate against a gradient. And now we have this all shuffling at the same time. So we basically have taken phosphate that we could take from the phosphate solubilizing bacteria. We give that to the legume plant. The legume plant gives that to the rhizobium bacteria. The rhizobium bacteria fixes more nitrogen. So that nitrogen goes into the rhizobium from the rhizobium into the legume plant. Some of that nitrogen then goes from the legume plant into the mycorrhizal fungus so that that mycorrhizal plant can take that nitrogen over to the non-legume plant so that non-legume plant can get the nitrogen and the phosphorus that it got from the phosphate solubilizing bacteria. All of this is happening 
simultaneously in the soil, solving these nitrogen and phosphorus needs. We can have these things occurring, not just for nitrogen and phosphorus, but for a number of different things, if we start tapping into the Brown Revolution and building on this pyramid. And I know that I'm holding you up from lunch, so we're not going to totally go into the principles, but we can talk about this later. But there's a reason why this is sort of this pyramid design. Because we're going to start with the foundation of living roots, and we're going to cap it off with protecting the soil, with the soil armor and with tillage. But the most important thing is to get food into the system. And the most important thing for us right now is to get food into our bodies. Thank you, Chris.